It's Mock Draft Monday, which means another Mock Draft. And finally, we can move past the Bears. Will they, won't they, with Justin Fields? I'm not watching Jim and Pam on The Office all over again. Justin Fields is gone. Caleb Williams is the guy at number one overall. It's plain as day. That's exactly what's going to happen. And now we have confirmation. The Bears fans supporting Fields started to get a little bit of juice when Fields wasn't traded. They're like, oh, it's because the Bears don't want to trade him. Not because nobody wants him, essentially, which is what a lot of it came down to. Apparently, four teams were interested, and Fields' preference was to go to the Steelers, and that's what happened. But we know Caleb Williams will be the number one overall pick at this point, and I think it's the right decision. And the way I I, I would say, uh, the thing I would say about it is this, right, is that we've seen three years of Justin Fields, more or less, right? And he's not proven to be the guy. His processing is behind NFL standards. He's not incredibly accurate. He does have potential, right? There's a world where Justin Fields ends up being ends up being like a, a solid to above average starting quarterback at some point, but it wasn't going to be with Chicago. It wasn't going to be within this first contract. So it doesn't make sense to keep him and then have to extend him after this next season. And as you guys know, starting quarterbacks are not cheap. If the Bears wanted to extend Fields and didn't draft a QB, they don't have any leverage in the contract negotiations. They'd be doing exactly what the Giants did and paying Justin Fields near $40 million a year, especially with the salary cap going up. And as we know, that was a mistake. With Caleb Williams, you get the rookie contract. It's $10 million per year, essentially, for the number one overall pick for the first four years, you know, more or less. And then you get the fifth year option. You can continue to build around your young QB. And the fact of the matter that... that the Bears haven't really had a successful QB. That doesn't mean you stop trying. If anything, it means you go and try to get one, especially when you're at number one overall. Caleb Williams makes the most sense, and I still think Drake May makes, uh, makes the most sense at number two. Really love him as a prospect. Had not a great situation this past year at UNC. The talent is unbelievable. He's such a great player, and the Commanders get their QB of the future after trading Sam Howell to the Seattle Seahawks behind Geno. And then at number three, this is one of those spots that is starting to get somewhat contentious about, okay, well, is this actually going to be a quarterback or is it Marvin Harrison Jr.? And for me, I think it has to be a quarterback. Yeah, I don't really care much about what a coach or a GM says about around draft season. It's a lot of smoke screens. You can't really trust much. But Gerard Mayo did come out and say we're going to take a very good player at a very important position, essentially, more or less. And that is Jaden Daniels. He's one of the better players in this draft. He's in that upper echelon of the QB prospects. I think the Patriots stick and pick and go QB at three. And especially an organization like the Patriots, you know, they want to get back to winning ways. They don't want to be picking at three or lower or a higher, maybe, you know, this time next year. They want to be out of this. And so many people are saying... Well, the Patriots roster is so bad, they shouldn't take a QB because the QB is going to go into a terrible situation. But it is much easier to get more talent around them later in the draft. You're not really going to be able to find that QB later in most cases. So maybe they trade down. Maybe they try to get a better overall player. But Jaden Daniels is really good. I just think you can't pass on a QB if you believe in the QB. And I think they will at number three overall. But things actually might get tough for the Cardinals at number four. Now, reports are circulating, which is not unbelievable to me the way it might be to you guys. Stay with me here. That some teams might prefer Malik Neighbors to Marvin Harrison Jr. And maybe not if you're building a big board. Harrison Jr.'s an extremely complete player. Great hands, great size, very solid route runner. Here's the thing. Neighbors is certainly more explosive. Not debatable. More explosive, more dynamic, maybe you could say. Big time deep threat who is amazing after the catch. You can't quite say the same of Marvin Harrison Jr. So again, if you're building a big board for and you don't represent any team, Harrison Jr., yeah, overall the better player, maybe we can say. Neighbors, though, into a particular offense, depending on what you're looking for, a very different player for Marvin Harrison Jr. And to a particular team, they might prefer his skill set. I think that is fair to say, even though there's going to be a lot of pushback on that. He is 
extremely explosive and great after the catch. There, and he can get down the field. He's a very, very, very good receiver prospect. So to a particular team, they might prefer him. So does that potentially mean that Harrison Jr. is not the number four overall pick? And now it, it, it's like I'm setting up to take neighbors here. I don't think I'm doing that. There's been so much hype around J.J. McCarthy recently. The Vikings have traded for the number 23 overall pick, and I don't think that's because they want to take two picks here in the first round. I think they're trying to get more ammo to trade up in the draft. So what this boils down to is do the Cardinals feel comfortable trading out of the number four spot for a haul of picks? They did it last year, right, with the Texans. Monty Ocean Fort traded down. And they still maybe got the guy they wanted anyway. But you're trading down a little bit more at this point. 4 to 11. And we saw, well, we saw a trade back up is the thing. But 4 to 11 is a long way to go. You will probably lose out on Harrison, Neighbors, and Odunze. So do they really want to take a receiver here at 4? Or do they trade back and get a haul? I'm going to keep it the same today. I do just want to throw out the possibility that... The Cardinals could be a trade spot in the draft. But Harrison Jr., just a very, very good prospect. Solid as they come, in my opinion. And I think you really can't go wrong with him at number four, especially when you really need receiver. But it, it could end up being a trade spot, as could the Chargers at number five. And now I think at this point, the Giants and Vikings may have called the Cardinals and said, hey, we want to make a trade for number four. And that would be for J.J. McCarthy, as much as people are not going to like that. It's a possibility. Uh, there's a lot of a smoke there right now, and when there's smoke, there's fire sometimes. So, you know, it's a possibility that a team moves up for J.J. McCarthy, even though a lot of you guys watching don't like him. And the Cardinals maybe didn't feel good enough about the trade package or felt so good about Harrison Jr. that they just stay put and draft him at four. Well, I don't know that the Chargers would at number five, and they have a lot of holes on their roster. They've obviously parted ways with Keenan Allen to Chicago. They have parted ways with Mike Williams. Cut. Receiver's a big need, but it's a very talented receiver class. And we know a couple of things about the Chargers, Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman. Roman doesn't prioritize receivers. Doesn't do it. Jim Harbaugh doesn't prioritize receivers. It's been a lot of power run. And I don't know that their identity screams that right now. And unless you feel so good about the receiver at number five, and you totally could, you totally could, it would not be a mistake to take a receiver here. But is that what Jim Harbaugh essentially and company decide to do? And I'm not sure that they do if the Vikings are offering them multiple first round picks in this year's draft when you have a lot of holes on the roster. I don't know that they stick and pick here at number five. Offensive tackle, wide receiver very much in play. It's a stacked class for both. If you move down to 11, you can still probably get a very good player at either of those positions. So we are going to make a trade here with the Minnesota Vikings moving up for number five. Now, I think it would be more than just 11 and 23. You could see a pick swap somewhere in here. Maybe the Chargers give up 140 and get back 129 and a one next year or something like that. I know three first-round picks seems incredible to move for a player, but here's the deal, is that often that's what it takes to move up for a quarterback. Not always, but oftentimes that's what it takes. Now, maybe it's 11-23 and a three. I don't think it's just 11-23 for five. I don't think that's going to be what it is. And even if you throw in 37, I just don't agree with the pro football focus trade simulator here. It costs more to move up for QB. We know it. We've seen it. We saw it with Trey Lance. We saw it with Mitch Trubisky. And I think the Lance trade especially is the one to look at because he wasn't even one of the first, you know, two quarterbacks off the board. He had one season of production at North Dakota State. And it doesn't say so much more about the prospect than it does about just the position. QBs are expensive. It costs a lot to move up for them. The Vikings, I don't know that I would say desperation describes their situation, but I think they might be enamored with J.J. McCarthy. And oftentimes, it does cost multiple first-round picks, three to move up. We'll do 11-23 and a three today. But it's tough to say what the exact compensation would be. I would expect a pick, a pick swap somewhere, late rounds, maybe a five for a four, something like that. 
For right now, it's just a bit of clutter, though. I know people are going to be upset that I'm not ironing out exact specifics because I don't know exactly what it would be. I can tell you it would be at least two firsts and potentially a third. So today it's 11-23 and a future three to move up for five. And that could be the return. And the Vikings jump the Giants who might take J.J. McCarthy at number six and they take him at five. And I just think we know the Vikings are eyeing a trade up for a QB. I think the top three guys are going to be off the board, which means they still must really like J.J. McCarthy. And they traded for 23 for a reason. I think that's to trade up for a QB. That's my expectation. So we'll see what happens on draft night. Still a while away. It's March 18th. We have another month and maybe about a half until the draft. So a lot can change. But I think the Vikings are really going to try and put themselves in position for a QB. And I don't think they're going to make a trade before the draft unless it's for number four. That would be my expectation because think about it this way. What if they can only get five right now and then come draft night, the Giants jump them for four and then take a QB and the Vikings are sitting around with, you know... Uh, the, whatever expression you want to say there. I'm going to keep it PG on the channel, but the Vikings are at five SOL because the first four QBs are off the board in the first four picks. Do you take Bo Nix at five? Do you trade down after trading up? We'll see what happens, but I don't expect a pre-draft day trade unless the Cardinals are absolutely locked into four, which maybe they are. Should be really fun to find out what happens. Giants at six. This could be a trade down spot, honestly, but... I just think one of the top two receivers is too much to pass on at this point. And they both could be gone already at this point. Like, there's a real-world scenario where Neighbors and Harrison Jr. are off the board at 3-4 and four, or 4-5, four and five, and then the Giants can't get either one of those guys. That's a possibility, but I'm going to go—let's go, let's go Roma Dunze today. It's often Malik Neighbors for me. I'll mix it up today and go with Roma Dunze. Giants get some size in the receiver room. Not that Neighbors is small. He's like 5'11", 6 foot, Odell type size, who was obviously capable of playing on the outside. I would say playing on the outside is not really about height so much as it's about separation ability. Play strength obviously plays an impact as well. But we're going Roma Dunze. I think the Giants, who knows how they have these receivers ranked. It's so close. They're all so talented. It could be a Dunze over Neighbors. It could be Neighbors over a Dunze. Neighbors could be off the board at this point. Here, he sticks around for a little while. As the Titans at number seven, I think are locked into an offensive tackle. Tackle is such a bad spot for them. They're trying to upgrade the interior of their line. I think they've done a decent job doing that. Brought in Lloyd Cushenberry to play center. And tackle, still a very bad position for them, obviously. Big contract to Calvin Ridley. Joe Alt, plug and play left tackle for them. Can't really be mad about that. Now your left side is Joe Alt and Peter Skaronsky. Pretty awesome duo. Should be able to run on that side easily. At number eight, you have the Atlanta Falcons. And I will say, eight and nine are very difficult picks to project for me right now because I have the Falcons fans and an organization saying that Dallas Turner is not their number one edge in the draft. Is that true? Is it a smokescreen? I don't know. All I know is that Dallas Turner seems to be a perfect fit for them really seems to be an unbelievable fit for the Falcons. Raheem Morris as a defensive coordinator, Guru, becomes their head coach, obviously, from the Rams, and he could really benefit from a big-time, uber-athletic edge rusher. That's Dallas Turner. However, even after the Bears trade of Keenan Allen, receiver's still a need for them. They lose Darnell Mooney. Valus Jones is not a competent wide receiver three. You could definitely have the Bears looking to take receiver the pick after you. Would the Falcons take a receiver? Rondell Moore is a Band-Aid. You bring in Darnell Mooney, but you need a wide receiver three. So is it a receiver? Or is it defense? Or is it what I'm going to do here, which is a trade down? I'm going to have the Jets move up for number eight. They might, you know, add in number 111 or something like that. Maybe you see a pick swap as well. Pick swaps are extremely common. Maybe it's 256 uh, or 185 and they get 197 to kind of make that a little bit more fair or, you know, something in this neighborhood. I'm going to have the Jets 
who are really trying to go all in around Aaron Rodgers, really looking for a big time wide receiver too. They bring in Tyron Smith. They bring in Morgan Moses. Tackle for this season seems to be pretty much solved. They could take a tackle for the future, or they could draft a player who's sticking on the board in this case to be a, a big time weapon on the outside. Garrett Wilson, Malik Neighbors. Now you got some weapons at receiver. The Jets go with Malik Neighbors at number eight after a trade. Does he stick on the board that long? Well, if he does, a team could go up and get him. Very, very good player. I'm super excited for this draft. I know this mock draft's going to end up being pretty weird looking, but I mean, we're always surprised by what happens in the draft. Trades shake everything up. It's a super fun time of the year. But now the Bears here at number nine, the player that they might have drafted at number nine is now off the board as a team jump them and maybe the Falcons take neighbors at number eight anyway. Real possibility of that. But here's where I sit with the Bears is the Bears don't have a lot of picks in this draft. Yes, they have two top 10 picks and three in the top 75, but just four picks in the entire draft. That's not great. That is a bad, bad situation for Chicago. And they are a talented team. So maybe you do stick and pick at number nine and just go with a player that you know can help you. Maybe it's a Jared Verse, right? Maybe it's a Byron Murphy or a team could move up. Now, it's a really, really talented tackle class. It's a really talented uh, group of players here at the top of the board, really. Brock Bowers is here. Troy Fa'atanu, Talisa Fuaga. You have the top corners in the draft here. Quinion Mitchell, Terry and Arnold. I mean, if you look at the tackles, we have JC Latham could end up being a top 10 pick, realistically, as could Talisa Fuaga, as could Troy Fa'atanu, as could Olu Fashinu. The tackle class is extremely stacked. Maybe there's a preference to one of those guys, but I think the Bears trade down. But you can't just trade down. A team has to move up. So we have to figure out which team would be moving up for which player? And it's tough to it's tough to really know what that would be. If we expect the Bears to take, you know, or if we expect the Falcons to take Dallas Turner, maybe you have a team that tries to jump them for Dallas Turner. I expect him to be the first defensive player off the board. Who knows if that ends up happening? But for a team that could really use a big-time edge rusher, I think maybe the Broncos could be in position uh, to move up. Now, the thing is, they don't have a second-round pick, but they do have a lot of picks down the board. And it might not cost a significant amount if they were to move some mid-round picks to jump the Falcons and the Chargers. So, in this scenario, I'm going to be the Broncos sending 12, 136, and 145 to get number 9. The Bears need more picks. The Broncos really have plenty. Could even go like maybe, you know, 203 and 145, and that might have a chance to be accepted. BFF thinks so. Who knows if that, you know, holds much weight. But the Broncos jump a couple of teams here. And for a team that really needs help in the trenches, and they also need a big time corner, I get it. But you move up for a great scheme fit in Dallas Turner. He is explosive, he's an incredible athlete. And now you have a group of edge rushers you can really work with. I like the potential of Baron Browning, but Dallas Turner has real true game record potential. And the Broncos, we all think, are going to trade up for a QB. QBs are off the board. Maybe you just trade up a couple spots for some late round picks, a compensatory pick or two, some picks that you traded for. And then you go up and get Dallas Turner to be a phenomenal player for you. He goes probably higher than this in a lot of other years. It happens to be stacked offensively. He's available at number nine. Broncos go up and get their guy. I know a lot is happening. Maybe the Broncos aren't a team looking to trade up, but Dallas Turner is a player potentially worth trading up for if it doesn't cost you too much. And in this case, it doesn't. Falcons at number 10. Corner, edge, interior defensive line. Wide receiver probably not in play after you trade out of Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze. And the reason you can do that, by the way, if we look at their picks, they have 10, 43, 74, 79. With the amount of talent at receiver in this year's draft, you don't have to take a receiver at number eight overall or even at number 10 because a lot of these stud receivers will be available at 43, 
or 74 or 79, even into the 100s in the fourth round, there will be awesome receivers available. You don't necessarily need to take one to be wide receiver three at number eight or here at number 10. So that was the incentive to trade down there. And the Falcons can look to either get CB2, a big time edge, or an interior defensive lineman. I'm going to go Jared Verse. Jared Verse is a really good player. Really, really strong, powerful hands. We've said the entire draft cycle. Good athlete. I like Jared Verse. And all right, maybe the Falcons don't have Dallas Turner as edge one. They want a bit of a bigger presence on the edge. Jared Verse at number 10 is a pretty good pick. And then at number 11, Chargers back on the clock. And wow, things really could not have worked out much better for them because Brock Bowers is still here if you want to go Brock Bowers. But you also have the talented tackle still on the board and potentially a guard in Talisa Fuaga. Very power run oriented. That fits what we think about when we think about Jim Harbaugh. Bob Tano is a good player, but maybe not a good fit here with the Chargers because of Rashawn Slater but it gives you guard flexibility. Same thing with Fashionu. Not guard flexibility-wise, but maybe just not at left tackle what you're looking for when you already have for Sean Slater. But getting Talisa Fuaga to play right guard or right tackle, I know about, you know, the guard situation there already. You have Zion Johnson you're trying to develop right, but Fuaga could potentially start, and he'd be, I guess, replacing Jamari Salyer, I believe, at right guard. So Talisa, and he's a good player, right? But I like him as a swing tackle, Fifth O lineman, sixth O lineman, you know, somewhere where maybe he has to start, maybe he's the bench guy. Fifth or sixth, best O lineman on the team. Fuaga could come in and start at right guard right away. And he could also potentially play right tackle over Trey Pipkins, right? So thinking about what Jim Harbaugh and the Chargers might do, I don't really know that they have to take a receiver in round one. And if they do, it doesn't have to be at 11, it could be at 23. I think in such a strong tackle class, you go with a really, really good player, and that's Talisa Fuaga. He can play right tackle or right guard. Shorter arms. Does he stick at tackle? We don't know. He's been very good at Oregon State, but you have the flexibility there, and Fuaga at 11 seems like just a really solid pick here, when maybe you'd consider him at number five. So, after a trade down, you get 11 and 23, and now maybe you can get two really good players instead of just one. I know it's tough to pass on Brock Bowers, who I feel like be a perfect fit in the Greg Roman offense. But in this scenario, they do pass on him in favor of a versatile, powerful offensive lineman. Might not love that if you're the Chargers. We need wide receiver. Well, I get it. But you have 23 now. You have your, you know, second and third round picks. I don't really think that... You need to go out and take a receiver this high in the draft if you can get more picks to help the rest of your roster. In their specific case, and I'm just thinking in the past about how Greg Roman used receivers in Baltimore. Tight end was always really the focus there. And they have a lot of good depth at tight end. Maybe it's Brock Bowers there. Maybe it's O-line. I don't know. Maybe it's even receiver. Not saying it's impossible. Bears back on the clock at number 12. They traded back in favor of landing some picks there I think it was on day three and that can help fill out the roster a little bit more at number 12 Brock Bowers would be a ton of fun but they brought in Gerald Everett I'm not sure that Bowers is in play here to the Bears especially when you have Cole Komet Byron Murphy certainly very tempting and it still feels like there's a world where the Bears could consider an offensive lineman and maybe even it's Talisa Fuaga to play right guard if they wanted to do that. Be very interesting. It just I just don't see it with Tevin Jenkins and Nate Davis. Like, I don't know who you're going to have to play center. Maybe this is a shock Jackson Powers Johnson at 12. I think they probably lean defensive line. And I still really like the potential of Byron Murphy. If you're considering edge rushers, feels a little bit early for a lot of these guys. I'm going to get Byron Murphy, the second off the board at number 12. Hook him, of course. Great player and a really good fit on this Bears interior defensive line. He's very good against the run. He's a really great athlete, can rush the passer, and is maybe the best pass rushing interior defensive lineman in this draft. But all around complete player, a little bit undersized, but it's not necessarily a problem on the interior of the defensive line when you're 
you know, winning the leverage game as well as he's able to. Raiders at 13. I think it's defense. I think it's corner, probably, if you can't take a QB. A tackle or a corner really is what is most in play for me. And you got some options. You're likely looking for a right tackle or a starting outside corner. And I'm not sure you can go wrong with Quinion Mitchell and Terry and Arnold here. And, of course, J.C. Latham seems like a plug-and-play starting right tackle after you lose Jermaine Illuminor. I'm going to go J.C. Latham. Big tackle from Bama at number 13. Played right tackle at Bama. He's going to be an NFL right tackle. And Daniel Jeremiah actually posted a very interesting thing the other day that I saw on Twitter, which was the last 10 drafted offensive linemen in the position they play primarily in the NFL. Out of the last 10, you have one guard, Quentin Nelson. You have four left tackles and five right tackles. So the NFL really does value the right tackle. It isn't just, oh, blindside protector and right tackle will figure out. The NFL values these guys. Right tackles are as important as ever. And J.C. Latham is a very good one and could be a top 10 pick, goes here at 13. Also could be, you know, outside of the top 20. It's tough when all these tackles are so good. It depends which team is picking and, you know, who they would take. Saints at number 14. They need bodies up front, both sides of the line. And based on the talent available on the defensive line right now, I think they would lean offense. And I see Olu Fashinu just kind of sticking out. Troy Fa'atanu is a really interesting option. But Fashinu, I think, is your left tackle of the future. He is a great pass protector. Again, we've talked about the entire draft cycle. Has sometimes struggled with power like JT Tuimolowau, Jack Sawyer. But overall has been a tremendous player. Has improved against or at, uh, in run blocking over the past season as well. I think his best football is ahead of him, but he's also been very good. And it, the Saints have really struggled to get a really good pass protecting left tackle in there for a while now. Olu Fashinu, he would solve that. And then we get to the Colts at 15. Man, Brock Bowers has been the uber popular pick here. Everyone's doing it. And originally it didn't make sense to me, but then you see, okay, Jelani Woods has dealt with injury. I mean, did he even play in 2023? I don't think so. Andrew Ogletree, DV, off the team, essentially. So what do you actually have at tight end? And it's not much. It isn't much. He's a really good player. There are talks about the Colts maybe landing Legereus Sneed. Not sure if that has any validity to it. We haven't had any real reports of that being a thing. In fact, I saw that the Colts and Chiefs have not engaged in negotiations for Legereus Sneed. So, corner still in play. Receiver in play. But I'm thinking, you know, could a team make a move up for Brock Bowers? That could be really interesting. That could be very, very interesting. And I look at the Bengals. I still look at the Dolphins moving up for a tight end, Brock Bowers. I think that'd be a really fun fit in their offense. Just because Bowers is not your typical tight end, as we all know. He's such a good player. But how high does a tight end go in the draft? I know we saw Kyle Pitts go top five. And I'm, not, I'm not sure it happens this year. It's, he could be the number five overall pick. I wouldn't be shocked to the Chargers. But he's sticking around here a little bit because he just plays one of those lesser positions in the NFL. They're just not quite as valuable. You know, we saw Dalton Kincaid go at the you know mid or back end of the first round. So, does Brock Bowers go here at 15? Do the Colts go in a different direction? And I hate to just follow the crowd here, but Bowers is falling. He's available at 15. You could use a tight end. Get Anthony Richardson, his new best friend. It feels like a great fit. You're able to retain Michael Pittman. I like the idea of Brock Bowers to the Colts now factoring everything in. And yes, the Bengals are in play. I really do think the Dolphins could consider a move up. Just do they have the ammo? And considering all the holes they have, I don't think they're in trade-up mode. I think they're in reevaluate for Tua contract extension mode. I don't know. Bowers, just a very good player there at 15. And we get to the Seattle Seahawks at 16. Well... They lost Damian Lewis. He's headed to the Panthers, right? So guard continues to be a need for them. And if you look at the guys that could potentially play guard, you look at Troy Fatanu, and you look at Jackson Powers Johnson, center or guard flexibility, right? 
Big dude. But probably going to be an NFL center. I think either of those guys are really in play here at 16. But I like the idea of Jackson Powers Johnson because he's a more natural interior player. Fab Tanu might be able to stick at left tackle. He had 34-inch arms. It's fine. Like, that's totally fine at left tackle. Jackson Powers Johnson, mauling starting center. Plug and play. Great senior bowl day one. He's an awesome, awesome player. And had a great season at Oregon this past year, more importantly, I would say. Then we get to the Jags at 17. The Jags have had an interesting offseason. Brought in Gabe Davis, lost Calvin Ridley. And the more I think about it, I think really two positions are in play. I think corner is absolutely something they would consider here at number 17, especially with the corners all being on the board still. Is this the way things play out in the draft? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But they could also use help on the O-line. Now, I'm looking at tackle of the future, and I see that, you know, can you rely on Cam Robinson? Center is an obvious need for them, but there's not one available here at 17. So what do they do? And I think, I think based on the players still available, I think you could have a team that wants to move up for an offensive lineman with Troy Fa'atanu still on the board. And could that be the Eagles? I think there's a chance of that. And I guess they'd be playing him at right tackle eventually. Would the Eagles move up? I don't know. I mean, I just think all the top corners are still on the board. It's it's an interesting spot. There are a bunch of really good players still here. And that complicates things because would a team consider moving up? We'd, we've had a run here of no trades. I guess four in a row is not that crazy. But could we see a team move up for a player? I'm going to stick and pick and go Quinion Mitchell. Boundary, starting cornerback potential. I mean, has the speed, obviously, to play field corner. You have Tyson Campbell there still. He's a really, really good athlete. And I think most importantly for Trent Baalke will fit the size and speed requirements and feels like a perfect fit in Jacksonville. You need a CB2. Quinion Mitchell can be that guy. Darius Williams headed back to the Rams, right? Bengals at 18. I think this is kind of easy for me. I'm going to go with Troy Fatanu. Maybe it's Amarius Mims. Fatanu, of course, played left tackle at Washington. You'd be moving over to right tackle with the Bengals because Orlando Brown Jr. wants to play left tackle. I don't know how much of that is him wanting to get paid as a left tackle versus actually just needing to play there. But Fatana, you'd be taking to move over to right tackle. He's a really good offensive lineman. has great movement skills. And again, long enough arms to stick a tackle. He'd be moving him over to tackle, but we've seen it work really, really well with guys like Panay Sewell, for example. He's one of the best overall tackles in the league. Left tackle at Oregon, of course, NFL right tackle. Rams on the clock. I'll tell you, I'm about to make an annoying pick. And I get that, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> At number 19, the Rams are going to take, for me today, Jerzon Johnny Newton. And their defense needs help as it is. And then Aaron Donald retires. Well, you still need help on defense. You could use help at corner. You could use help on the edge. You could use help on the interior defensive line anyway. And then Aaron Donald retires. One of the best defensive players really in NFL history. And you can't replace him. You can't. I mean, no one you're going to take is Aaron Donald. But and I hate to do this. It's going to be so annoying. I'm sorry about this, what I'm about to say. But maybe they see a slightly undersized interior defensive lineman and think that it's a good fit into their system. He's not Aaron Donald. I'm not saying he is. But he is also similarly undersized with crazy explosiveness. It's not a one-to-one -one replacement, obviously, but it is a position of need, and he is a really good player. It fits here at 19. Warner still on the board, but Johnny Newton ends up just being a good fit for their needs right now, and he's a really good player. And it's also, if you look at, you know, another undersized interior defensive lineman out of pit, you look at the Bucks last year, I think they were at 19. So Johnny Newton, I mean, maybe there's some precedence there. Maybe there's a precedence that was already set, I should say, as we get to the Steelers at 20. 
Been offensive line for me a lot, and I can still see a Marius Mims here. But with the great corner sticking on the board, I'm going to go Terry on Arnold. And I feel like he's such a great fit for the Steelers. I mean, they got that Alabama secondary there over the past couple of years. Minka Fitzpatrick, of course, Levi Wallace was there, is no longer. But Terry and Arnold just feels like a Steeler. He's a guy that's not afraid to come up and hit. He can tackle. He, he's a really good player in coverage. Some people are asking me because he ran a 4-5 flat. Oh, does that take him out of the first round? Blah, blah, blah. That's fine, Speed. You're totally fine at 4-5. That You're not even slow. You're just like average to maybe slightly below average. And that's not really an issue. So for Terry and Arnold, when you do everything else so well, your game is not predicated on a 40 time. It's technique. And it's a willingness to really be a dog out there on the field. He's able to come up and hit. You know, I see. I think Cooper DeGean is a similar player in some ways. Obviously, a little bit more size with DeGean. But Arnold, really good player. Could be the best corner in this draft. He's available at 20. The Steelers, I know they traded for Dante Jackson. I totally get that. I totally get it. I don't think that takes him out of corner here at 20. What about Dante Jackson? I know it's going to be said. I don't think that impacts really anything. He's a good player. The Steelers just extended him to a one-year contract that actually saved cap a salary cap space. Now, with trading Deontay Johnson, I think you absolutely could consider a receiver here. But are you taking Brian Thomas Jr. or Adonai Mitchell there? Are they similar to what you have in George Pickens already? I mean, they, they're great players for sure, but they might just value the top corner a little bit above, you know, the top available receivers. But it could be a receiver. It could be a tackle. Center, it seems a little bit early, maybe for Zach Frazier. But I, I'm going corner today. And that's maybe because he's the best corner in the draft, potentially, at number 20. At number 21, we have the Miami Dolphins. Well, this is another one of those tough spots for me. Because you look at the Dolphins, and it's not like they have a ton of picks here in this draft. They pick at 21.55, and then not until 158. And the Dolphins seem to be kind of in a little bit of a rebuild type mode. Do the Dolphins potentially trade out of this pick? I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to have them trading with a team they have some familiarity with already. That's the Kansas City Chiefs. They pick at 32. I'm moving 95 and a 4 next year. Moving up 10 spots. Also sending a 5 from Miami next year from Denver. It's not really a ton. But the Dolphins get... Another top 100 pick, which they're sorely lacking. And they move back and, you know, maybe 64 could even be in play here. You know, the Chiefs are such a talented team. I could see that being a possibility. Maybe it's like, we could rework this to be 32, 64. And, you know, maybe 159 or 184 from the Dolphins. That's also a possibility. There are a million different ways we could do this. But I'm going to have the Chiefs trading 95, 159 for 21 and a 5 next year. The Dolphins need more picks. They get more picks. They move down 10 spots. They're still going to be able to get a good player at 32. And the Chiefs move up for a wide receiver. We know they need it. And... You can't really go wrong here with the receivers on the board. I'm going to go Brian Thomas Jr. He's a big-time deep threat with size. They bring in Hollywood Brown on a one-year deal. Doesn't impact much for me. But Brian Thomas is 6'3", near 210 pounds with 4'3 speed. He had 17 touchdowns last season. He can play. And bringing him together with Patrick Mahomes is an awesome combination. The Chiefs move up for their guy. The Dolphins need more picks. They get some. Thomas Jr. to the Chiefs is a really fun combo. I am worried about the rest of the AFC West. Eagles at 22. Well, you have options here. And I just feel like it's tough for me to look at Philadelphia and not just go O-line because it's what they do. But they need corner. And there are some good corners still on the board. Cooper DeGene, Nate Wiggins. Like this is, there's a lot of potential here. But also Amarius Mims. It's just, it's, it just screams Eagles to me. And I know they have other needs, but how do the Eagles draft? This is what they do. Amarius Mims continues their Georgia pipeline, right? We know they love the Georgia players recently. Amarius Mims is a developmental right tackle. 
Interesting. That is going to be a first-round pick probably, right? Whose team does that fit? A Georgia developmental right tackle with superhuman size, strength, and footwork. That screams Philadelphia Eagle to replace Lane Johnson somewhere down the line. He's going to go to Jeff Stoutland University and probably become an amazing right tackle. And the Eagles historically have been able to find these positions down the board and remain competitive, but tackle, it's much tougher to do that. Linebacker, corner, safety, they're going to figure out another way. They brought back Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, right? Uh, Chauncey, or what is it? You go by CD, Deuce? I don't know. CJ Gardner-Johnson. But Amarius Mims here, just, it's just, I think it's just going to be too much for Howie Roseman and the Eagles to pass on. Then we get to the Chargers at 23. Well, you need receiver. You didn't take one at 5 or 11. Of course, you could trade it down. But I think you could take one here. How about Adonai Mitchell? He's a really solid route runner with good size, can go up and get the football, and they need receiver. Now, do they do it in the first round? Again, I'm not sure. There's going to be good receivers down the board, but Adonai Mitchell presents pretty good value here at 23. Of course, Hookham, awesome route runner for his size, 6'2 and change, 205 pounds, fluid mover, and really solid hands. It just feels like a great pick for the Chargers here at 23. They need help with the position. Adonai Mitchell with Justin Herbert sounds fun. 24, we have the Dallas Cowboys. And they're another team. They lose Tyron Smith. They lose Tyler Biotish. And I know they have potential needs. Michael Gallup got cut, whatever. They have needs at receiver. They have needs on defense. But I just, I find it hard to believe that the Cowboys are going to walk out of the first round and not go somewhere in the trenches. I think it's going to come on the offensive side of the ball. And if you look at the offensive linemen available, Graham Barton, if you want a center, Tyler Guyton, if you want to tackle, which do they prefer? Barton, of course, played tackle at Duke, but also played center. He's projected to move inside. I, I find that the Cowboys could really take either of these players here. It would not surprise me. Today, I'm going to go with the tackle. I'm going to give them Tyler Guyton. I just think it's tough. You know, you lose Tyron Smith. Tyler Guyton's a really good athlete. You need tackle. It's just, this is a really good tackle class. I think they're going to end up taking one in the first. Packers at 25. Well, they bring in Xavier McKinney. That's interesting. And they lose David Bakhtiari, but we know they don't really like to go tackle in the first. You have Rasheed Walker. You have Zach Tom. You need tackle. Well, you lose Zach Runyon. Zach Runyon's not his name. You lose John Runyon Jr. I want to say Zach. For Zach Tom. You lose John Runyon Jr., Guards in need. Damn, they don't like to go along a line in the first. Uh, Graham Barton, I still feel like is a possibility here, but I just feel like we know what the Packers do. And they need corner. They still could use another safety. Cooper to Gene, man, it just makes way too much sense. It, he makes way too much sense if he gets to 25. He is a Packer. That's how I feel about it. I think it's probably the best player to team fit in the entire draft. Bucks trade Carlton Davis. They could use a corner. Nate Wiggins is just kind of sitting there. Obviously, electric speed. Kind of feels like a good fit here. I also think edge is a possibility. Layout two Latu's there. Chop Robinson, I, I do think, could very well find his way into the first round. Same thing with Darius Robinson. But Nate Wiggins is there, and you could use help at corner. And especially somebody that you can have under contract for four or five years. Nate Wiggins at 26 is the pick for me today. At number 27, have the Arizona Cardinals. And we definitely considered a trade down. Definitely did. Opted not to do that. And when you look at the Cardinals, it's not really that stacked of a team, right? You could go in any number of directions here. You trade for Desmond Ritter. That's a heck of a trade. Losing Rondell Moore, but obviously you weren't going to extend him. And when I look at the Cardinals depth chart here, and that's not the only way to do this, right? But... They bring in Jonah Williams in free agency. He's a solid starting right tackle. Wide receiver, obviously a need. Do they double dip on receiver in the first round? I don't think so. Interior O-line, still a need. Absolutely. And then with their defensive line, interior D-line's a need. Edge, potentially need as well. We got some good players in there. I don't think a linebacker uh, is going to be in play here for the Cardinals, but you never know. You never know. 
And then their corners. Yes, you bring in Sean Murphy Bunting, but corner is still in not so great of a spot. Keytrail Clark, I think, is really a slot corner. You could use a boundary, but of the available players, who fits the bill there? Well, Kamari Lassiter, Ennis Rakestraw, Kool-Aid McKinstry, I think, probably in play. I'm going to go Kool-Aid McKinstry. I could definitely see him falling a bit, and I could see Kamari Lassiter going over him. Ennis Rakestraw has, you know, a ton of potential, really physical corner. But I'm not sure he gets into the first. Has some injury history as well. That could definitely hurt his stock. I don't really think TJ Tampa is a first-round pick, but the potential is there, I suppose. And we get to the Bills at 28. And the Bills are in a tough spot. Very talented team. Losing Gabe Davis is not the end of the world. Hardly. But I do think that really still shows you that receiver is a big need. But they have some other big needs as well. Corner. Cut Tredavious White. Cut Jordan Poyer. Von Miller restructured, but Von Miller's not great anymore. Of course, you do sign Curtis Samuel, but that's maybe not an outside receiver. So, could still very easily take a receiver here in the first round. But defensively, man... I don't know that it's a linebacker here, but edge, corner, safety. Oh, safety is especially tough. Taylor Rapp and Cam Lewis slated in as, as the starters right now. Micah Hyde is uh, for a free agent as well. So maybe maybe you do consider a safety. Tyler Newbin's a really good player. Does Tyler Newbin go in the first round? This will be my first safety in the first round since probably my way too early mock draft close to a year ago at this point. It's a tough call. And you also lose Mitch Morse. Connor McGovern's in there at center. So you could consider a center here in Graham Barton at 28. But I think the Bills just have a lot of question marks right now about what they could or couldn't do. Maybe you consider a trade down if you can get another top pick. They have a lot of picks, especially down the board. But maybe you trade back and get another top 60 pick. And I'm going to have the Raiders move up for a QB. It's never cheap as we know. The Raiders want the fifth year option. That's why they're not waiting until 44. They want the fifth year option on the QB. Of course, bringing in Gardner Minshew does not stop you from drafting a QB. Neither does Aiden O'Connell. It's going to be 44 in a second next year for 28, 144, and 200. The Raiders push into the first round. The Bills move down to 44. And the Raiders will take Bo Nix, quarterback from Oregon. Very accurate. Good athlete. Can he push the ball down the field? He's shown to be able to at times. Bo Nix from Auburn is not Bo Nix from Oregon. He's developed as a player. Bit of an older prospect at this point. You'd hope he would have developed, and he did. But could be the answer at the starting quarterback position for the Las Vegas Raiders. They move into the first round to get him. And all things considered, it's not terribly expensive to do so if he's going to end up being your starting QB. Lions at 29. You got some options here. Leatu Latu, potentially. Graham Barton, potentially. Darius Robinson. I love where the Lions are right now. Kamari Lassiter. But the idea of drafting Graham Barton here at 29 to immediately slide inside to play left guard and then potentially center after the retirement of Frank Ragnow if that happens within the next four or five years. I really, really like that. Barton is a great player. Another one of these O-linemen that has shown the versatility to play multiple spots across the offensive line. He's another powerful dude. And at the college level, if you show me a guy that's such a good offensive lineman that he probably is a center or a guard but can play tackle because he's just that good... And now he gets to slide inside to a more natural position in the NFL. I just, I like that type of a player. I, I think about Elton Jenkins in the division with the Packers that can play every guard spot, can play tackle in a pinch, has played center, can do whatever you want. Graham Barton of the Lions is the Lions now Elton Jenkins type player. But can play whatever you need in a pinch, but starting left guard, Graham Glasgow at right guard, center Frank Ragnow for or however long he sticks around. Still a great player, obviously. Health could be a problem in the future, but Graham Barton is the guy at 29. And then at number 30, I just, I find this hard to believe 
that it won't be a tackle. I know you need receiver, corner, D-line, like you're losing Clowney. You were able to bring back Justin Matabike, which was huge, but you need tackles so badly. And there are some good ones available. Jordan Morgan, Kingsley Suamataia, who maybe the Lions fans are going to be upset that I passed on. Cousin of Panay Sewell could potentially slide inside to play left guard. That's a fun option. And then maybe play tackle in the future. But Barton ended up being the pick. But Suamataia to the Ravens. He is extremely athletic. He is a people mover, which is always good on the O-line. And gives you right tackle starting upside. And maybe he could even play left tackle beyond Ronnie Stanley, who's dealt with some injuries. I really like the upside of Kingsley Suamataia. I think he could end up being a first-round pick, and it wouldn't surprise me. But right now, you lose Morgan Moses. Ronnie Stanley's a big question mark. I just wonder what the Ravens' plan is at tackle. I have to expect that they're going to address that very high in the draft, maybe even as high here as 30. And the 49ers probably upset that that happened at 31. They need offensive line help. They also need corner, though. And maybe with Suamataia, Barton off the board, Tyler Guyton, obviously. Do you bring Jordan Morgan into the first? He could play guard. Or do you just go with cornerback? Because some of the good corners are just kind of sitting around. I'm going to go Kamari Lasseter out of Georgia. Starter upside very soon. Really good player. Had an amazing season for Georgia this past season. Love Kamari Lasseter. I think he's a first-round talent. Does he get into the first round? We'll have to see. And then you have the Dolphins at 32 after a trade down. And the Dolphins still have plenty of needs. The Dolphins, of course, lose Christian Wilkins to the Raiders in free agency. But based on the interior defensive lineman on the board, I'm not sure any of these guys are first-round picks. I'd love for my guy, Tavondre Sweat, to get in there. Hook him, of course. But I don't know that Braden Fisk is a first-round pick. Ruka Rororo, I don't think gets in. Chris Jenkins, despite the NFL bloodline, I don't think he gets in. Not sure I'm seeing a lot of first-round players of this group. We could. But I think with Leatu Latu falling down the board... Because of the injury concerns, the medical, he just may be too good of a player for Miami to pass on. Because you could use help on the edge. I know defensive interior. I know O-line. But there was a big run on offensive linemen. Jordan Morgan could be the answer to start at guard. That's totally an option here. I would not be shocked. But Leatu Latu is the most technical and maybe the best all-around edge rusher in the entire draft. How does he fall to 32, like I say every time? The medical stuff that forced him to retire and was not medically cleared to play and then had to transfer from Washington to UCLA. I've heard that not every team is completely good on the medicals there. So all it takes is one team. Maybe the Dolphins aren't willing to take that risk at 21, but it worked out pretty well with Jalen Phillips. Very similar situation, except he... Had to transfer from UCLA to Miami, not to UCLA. Leatu Latu is so good. And even though you need help on the interior of the D-line, even though you need help on the O-line, he is just maybe way too good to pass on. And I get that you have Bradley Chubb. You lose Andrew Van Ginkle. ABG's a tough loss off the edge, provided a lot of juice. But Leatu Latu is so technically sound and with the injury stuff with Bradley Chubb, I know you're paying him. You can never have enough good edge rushers. Leatu Latu is so good. So Dolphins take a chance on him at 32. I know if you're a Dolphins fan, you might be looking up and saying, oh man, we need, we need so many things more than edge. We need offensive line. We need interior defensive line. Leatu Latu is so good. And it's not like the Dolphins could not use help off the edge as well. So he ends up being the answer for me. You lose AVG, Leatu Latu is not a one-for-one -one replacement, but is a very good replacement on the edge. So, love him, and this is a very interesting draft. Mock Draft Monday got weird today, and I love it. I like getting weird with these, and these are realistic things that could happen in the draft. Craziness happens. If you think it's going to be chalk, it never is. You're in for a surprise. See you in the next one. Take it easy.